the church is called the double love experience church today is the launch of their church like we're a part of this y'all are you listening those of you who are listening we're a part of history we envision, we envision a jesus movement committed to black lives family welcome to the final week of our critical race theory and black faith preaching and teaching series yeah today we are dealing with is racism permanent this is what we've been leading up to all month y'all and so this is a real critical sermon in this series pastor andrew is bringing it home for us today this is a great service for you to share with your friends and family matter of fact why don't you take a moment right now and just share the stream uh, why don't you drop in the comments where you're worshiping from uh, we are so excited to bring this series to a close and bring the conversation to a beginning amen amen the, the virtual equivalent of of touch your neighbor is tag your neighbor uh, so that they can join I us like and uh, 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 the flesh and blood have not revealed this uh -huh. unto me uh, so tag your neighbor who needs to join us for this culminating critical race theory and black faith uh, worship uh, service and we look forward to streaming virtually into the house of the Lord together I don't know about you but uh, worship is uh, the height of the week because it gives us the insight and the energy that we need to do everything that God has called us to do. It's time to worship together, family. Oh, yeah. And let me tell y'all something. Pastor Andrew's preaching today. He got on his Black Panther shirt on the day he's preaching. Is racism permanent? Yes. So if I were you, I wouldn't miss this sermon. That's all I'm going to say. But let's get ready to worship. Our praise team comes to lead us in worship further right now. Amen, somebody. Praise the Lord, DLE. Did you come to let your praise rise in the room? Oh, you want to let your praise rise in the room? Do you want it to rise up to the Lord? Do you want it to rise up to the Lord? Let's go, let's go. Clap your hands. Hey. Yeah. Clap those hands. Yeah. Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the praises of our King rise among us. Let it rise. Whoa, say what? Let the glory of the Lord yeah. rise among us. Yeah. Let the glory of the Lord. Let it rise. 
Lord, you rise Let among the praises the praise of our King, our King rise, rise among us, let it rise. Yeah, one more time, let the glory, let the glory of the Lord Yes, sir, I like that. Rise among us, yeah. let the glory of the Lord Don't you need the glory of the Lord in your life? Let the praise rise. of our King Whoa. rise yeah. among us, let it rise. So I'm gonna praise the yeah, yeah, yeah. Rise among us, rise. Rise. Well, let's let the songs of the Lord, let the songs of the Lord, let it rise. rise among yeah, yeah. The songs, the the songs rise. rise. You got a song on your heart. Let the praise of the Lord rise. 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 Hey, and we cry.
glory. That's the altos. Come on, let me hear your altos. We want your glory. If you want it, if you want it, say. Randos. We want your glory. Hey, we want your glory. We want your glory. Yeah, we want your glory. Yeah. We want your glory. We want your glory. Yeah, yeah we want your glory. We want your glory. Hey, we want your glory. We want your glory. With my dinner time. We want your glory. We want your glory. Yes, sir. Say it all together now. All together. We want your glory. Hey, hey. We want, we want your glory. That's all we need. Yeah. We want your glory. That's all we need. We want your glory. That's all we need. Somebody. Hallelujah. Uh, believe wants to know if you feel the glory. That's what you said. Okay. All right. So I know it's virtual. I know. I know y'all can't feel what we feel. But but I just wonder if the band could just crank that one last time. And and I just wonder if you could get out of your head, get out of the get off your sofa, get get out of your bed. Put the fish down for like three minutes. Uh, and then I wonder if you might get a little loose in your body just a little bit. And I wonder if you might invite the glory of the Lord wherever you are. Because Emmanuel, God with us, is with us wherever we are. And I feel like you need God's glory. I just sense you need God's glory. I just imagine you need God's glory. Come on, y'all, one more time. Here we go. That's what we need to say. We want to to cover our lives, to cover us. We want your glory. To cover our minds, cover us. Come on, back at home. Glory. Anybody want to be healed? Anybody want to be healed? We want your glory. Anybody want to be healed? Anybody want to be healed? Come on, healed? back at home. That's what we need. Come That's on, move your feet at home. Glory. That's what we need. That's really what we need. We want your glory. Go wake up your neighbor. Tell the church now. Sundays off the of church. Come on, we want your glory. We want your glory. Oh, 
Hallelujah. Anybody feel a little bit lighter now that the glory of the Lord has risen in your home? Anybody feel a little bit lighter now that the glory of the Lord has risen in your car, has risen on your block, has risen wherever you may be? Hallelujah. And thank you, Jesus. You go down, praise Him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And in that spirit of the glory of the Lord being here, we're going to go before God for a quick word of intercessory prayer. Hallelujah. We're grateful for the glory of the Lord, which is our vanguard and our rear guard. We're grateful for the glory of the Lord. Hallelujah. Which is rising in our spirits, even as we prepare our hearts for prayer. Let every head bow, let every eye close, even virtually, and let's focus on God. Lord, we thank you for your glory. God, we thank you for all of the ways that your mercy comes into our lived experience. God, we are grateful for your grace that wakes us up another day, God. It's not coffee that wakes us up, Lord, or caffeine. It's not an alarm clock that wakes us up. It's your glory and your grace, God, that gives us another day. And God, we pause to say thank you for your glory, which you not only supplied to us, but you let the glory that we already experienced rise within us, God. We thank you for activating your presence in our lives, God. We thank you for energizing your glory in our lives, God. Not that we didn't have it, but we weren't always attentive to your glory. We're not always conscious of your glory. We don't always appreciate your glory, God. So we thank you for the dance. We thank you for the song. Because some things, God, hallelujah, we learn better by singing and dancing than we do by just listening, God. Thank you for your glory. We honor you, God. Somebody who's in need of prayer right now, God, we ask that you meet them at the point of their need. Your son Jesus taught us that you know what we need before we even ask, God. So we simply ask you to just move and meet all the needs, God, according to your riches the scriptures say in glory meet all of our needs in christ jesus name we pray amen amen and amen hallelujah y'all know what time it is go ahead and repeat after me our mission our mission is to create is to create a congregation a congregation committed to committed to the liberating the liberating love power love power ministry of jesus the christ ministry of jesus the christ we commit we commit to advancing the love and justice of God. To advancing the love and justice of God. Through dynamic worship. Through dynamic worship. Popular education. Popular education. Community organizing. Community organizing. And radical discipleship. And radical discipleship. Let's keep that same spirit of glory flowing as we recite our vision together. We envision. We envision. A Jesus movement. A Jesus movement. Committed to black lives. Committed to black lives. An equitable economy. An equitable economy for all God's creation for all God's creation and a spirit led mysticism and a spirit led mysticism which is the beautiful conviction that in God we live we move, we breathe, and we have our very being. Let's pick up together. That prioritizes. That prioritizes. Personal and public health. Personal and public health. The prophet Micah's enduring words. The prophet Micah's enduring words. Function as our centering image. Function as our centering image. We are a radical assembly of believers. We are a radical assembly of believers. Striving to do justice. Striving to do justice. Love mercy. Love mercy. Mercy. And walk humbly with our glorious God. And walk humbly with our glorious God. Amen, Amen. somebody. Amen. We thank God. We thank God. Listen, y'all, a couple of really exciting announcements. The first is my birthday's next week. Hey. Turn up, turn up, turn up, turn up. If it's your birthday, make some noise. Hey. If it's your birthday, make some noise. If it's your birthday, okay, make that's some noise. Next week, next week, we going up just like that next week. Uh, so I want y'all to tune in. One of my really good friends is preaching for us, Reverend Kaya Jennings. Um, and she's just amazing, and she's a powerful preacher, so I want you to tune in. Um, in that same birthday spirit, my mother's birthday was yesterday, y'all, August 28th. Ooh. So so can y'all just type in the comments, happy birthday, Dr. Kudjo. That'll make her feel happy good. Birthday, happy Dr. birthday, Kudjo. Dr. Kudjo. Uh, we love 
love to see it. If we have any August birthdays, can y'all make some noise in the comments? If we got August birthdays, we want to celebrate you. Um, but God is good. God is kind. The next thing I want you to know, September 12th, September 12th, September 12th, September 12th, September 12th we are back in the sanctuary for weekly worship with our congregants in Brooklyn, New York. Let the church say amen. Amen, 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 amen. amen, amen. amen. Y'all were, were with us all summer. Two of those three services ended up indoors. We're going to be right back where those indoor services were, right at 334 South Fish Street. So we want you to put that date on your calendar, invite individuals to worship with us. There will be some protocol. You'll have to sign in. You'll have to wear masks. We're doing contact tracing. It's not going to be all willy-nilly. We're going to make sure that that was the Southern in me. That was the Southern in me That's saying right. willy-nilly. Right. We're going to make sure that you are well cared for, um, but we want you to come on back into the house of the Lord. So save those dates with us. Uh, it's offering time. Uh, Pastor Andrew, I'm going to lift the offering. Amen. Amen. Let's look to God as we get ready to uh, give a, a generous gift unto the Lord. If you're able, uh, again, only if you're able, we ask if you could give 20 or, or $50. That would help us to uh, reopen in excellence and with what we need. Amen. And bless the Lord. Uh, there's three ways that you can participate in this giving moment. Uh, you can give via Cash App at DLE Give. Uh, secondly, you can give via PayPal at paypal.me uh, slash D-L-E give. Uh, or thirdly, you can give via Zelle using our email address, which is experience at gmail.com. Let us prepare the way to give unto the Lord with a time of prayer uh, followed by the praise and worship team coming. Good and gracious God, we thank you and we praise you for not only being a glorious God, but we praise you for being a generous God. And in recognition of your generosity, God, we entrust back to you a portion of what you have graciously and generously given unto us. Take these gifts, God, and use them for the advancement of your liberation, for the advancement of your salvation, just to help somebody else be blessed through the work of this church. We trust you to do it, and we rely on you to do it. In Jesus' name we pray. Let every heart say amen. Amen and amen. Amen. After the singing of the sermonic selection, Pastor Andrew will give us our last sermon series in this month. Is racism permanent?
see the goodness of the Lord. No good thing shall he withhold. No good thing shall he withhold. I will see the goodness of the Lord. team sang us powerfully uh, and deeply into the spirit. I don't know about you, but uh, I'm setting my hope on the Lord. I'm fixing my eyes on Christ, who according to the scriptures is still the author and the finisher of our faith. I'm setting my hope on the Christ, uh, who according to that same scripture, different translation, is the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith. That's why we set our hope on Christ. Well, beloved, it is preaching time, and we are excited uh, after an entire month of diving into critical race theory and black faith. Uh, here we are, family, uh, at the conclusion of the matter. Uh, there is indeed a word from the Lord. Uh, we invite you to turn with us in Scripture uh, to the Gospel according to John, uh, the 16th chapter, 33rd verse. I'll be reading from the New International Version. Once again, John's Gospel, 16th chapter, 33rd verse. And I'll be reading from the New International Version. It reads this way. In this world, you will have trouble. But take heart, for I have overcome the world. I'll read this one more time. In this world, you will have trouble. But take heart, says Jesus. For I have overcome the world. Let's look to God in prayer. Good and gracious God, we thank you 
for being the fountain of wisdom who gives us exactly what we need when we need it uh, so that we can live according to your word, according to the wonderful future that you have planned for us. God, be with us in this preaching moment. Let your word go forth that we might find what it is we need for the living of these days. In Christ's name we pray. Let every heart say amen, amen, and amen. Uh, the theme for this sermon is organized around a question. We usually organize sermons around declarations and affirmations, but uh, this sermon is organized around a question, which is, is racism permanent? Uh, I want you to uh, tell your neighbor, as Pastor Gabby says, tell your neighbor in your living room, uh, or rather inquire of your neighbor, is racism permanent? Is racism permanent? That's where we're going uh, for the time that is ours together. Uh, so I, I, I want to cut straight to the chase. I, I don't believe, bless the Lord, and, and, and hiding the sermonic ball. Is racism permanent? Uh, well, uh, kind of. Kind of is the, is the response I want us to sit with a bit. Racism in its current form uh, isn't necessarily permanent in God's creation. Uh, I don't believe we'll have the exact same version of racism any more than we have uh, endured the exact same version of capitalism. In other words, racism uh, shape shifts and racism changes forms. It, uh, it comes as Jim Crow Jr. and Jane Crow Jr. And then uh, you see the descendants of racism, which switches institutional arrangements. But if you scratch beneath the surface, it's the same old racism. Racism family in some form or another uh, will remain, I want to submit, on this side of heaven. Uh, let me see if I can give you an example and a reference point uh, by way of analogy. Capitalism uh, began as an industrial capitalism in England in the 18th century. Uh, and we know that capitalism wasn't just uh, an issue of economics, uh, but capitalism was undergirded, let the church say undergirded, uh, by racism and the transatlantic slave trade. Uh, but the way we experience our economy today is not like it was experienced in 18th century England. What we have now is a capitalism that's dominated by real estate and finance and big tech. So we still have uh, a kind of capitalism, but it's no longer industrial. It's instead what some call a casino capitalism. It's, it's dominated by different industries, by uh, nation states with different uh, kinds of gross domestic product. It's the same enemy, but it has a different face. Same enemy, but a different face. And in the same manner, I want to suggest that racism uh, in one form or another will be with us this side of heaven. Uh, I know that might feel like uh, cod liver oil to the saints to deal with that. I, I know it might feel uh, like something other than uh, uh, the, the, the kind of, uh, it may feel abrasive, relative to America's political culture of optimism. It, it may feel a little uh, different than name it and claim it and call it and haul it and blab it and grab it, but you know Pastor Gabby and I, uh, we, 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 we try to do our best with the help of the Holy Ghost to tell it to you straight. Paul put it this way. Paul said, I would not have you be ignorant, uh, and we would not have uh, the saints uh, be underinformed or misinformed about the nature of what it is that we're dealing with. Uh, I know the cultural common sense is that uh, America has produced an exceptional people, that we've never met a problem that we can't solve. I, I know that uh, in this country, sometimes we, we talk about uh, going from uh, the current state of a union to a more perfect union as if that's an automatic journey. But we want to declare uh, that this world, uh, according to Jesus, is one in which we will have trouble. Uh, racism, family, is something that will ultimately be defeated, let me hasten to add. But, but this side of heaven 
uh, I want to suggest that we'll always be battling racism. And in the same way, let me see if I could make a, a theological bridge. In the same way that uh, Jesus has struck a death blow relative to sin, but we're still battling sin, I want to suggest that racism is the same way. Jesus has defeated, uh, uh, the, the way they used to teach in a Sunday school, Jesus has defeated the power of sin, but we're still grappling with the wreckage and the after effects due to the presence of sin. And so the ultimate power of racism, we could suggest, is uh, defeated, but we're still dealing with uh, the afterlife of slavery and the afterlife of, uh, of Jim Crow. We're dealing with the afterlife of racism's most uh, harmful and disastrous effects on our community. And the Bible, in a way, anticipates this reality. The book of Exodus talks about a Pharaoh arising who didn't know Joseph. And when we skip forward further, the book of Judges uh, articulates a pattern of political authorities who uh, take consecutive turns, one after the other, oppressing Israel. Uh, let me see if I can put it to you this way. Uh, Reverend Dr. Jeremiah Wright used to make the, the excellent Bible study point that virtually all of Scripture is written under some form of imperial oppression. Uh, all of Scripture, from Genesis to Revelation, we see it uh, written under Egyptian oppression, under Babylonian oppression, under Assyrian oppression, uh, Persian oppression, and Roman uh, oppression. Why am I saying this? Because the, the battle that we face, uh, though it may uh, change forms over time, uh, we have a word from God that suits our times because God birthed a powerful word among a people God chose even uh, in the theater of oppression. Don't, don't get it twisted, family. Just because uh, racism may have a longer shelf life than what cable news will allow, just because racism has a longer shelf life uh, than what you can celebrate on MLK Day and celebrate on Juneteenth, just because racism has a longer shelf life than we may be accustomed to acknowledging, it doesn't mean that God isn't working. It doesn't mean that God isn't moving. It doesn't mean that God isn't uh, displaying revelation. It doesn't mean that God isn't uh, delivering uh, saints out of uh, context of hardship and adversity. God is still moving, even though we have this battle that we have to face. Scripture uh, speaks to the rise and fall of various empires that cause structural harm to God's people. And so in that sense, uh, Scripture anticipates the cultural and legal evil of contemporary versions of racism. Let me see if I can just say it uh, a, a different way. Uh, if, if we imagine racism to be a Goliath, uh, you can chop off the head of one Goliath, but there's always going to be another coming. And you're going to have to get your five smooth slingshots ready and take off the head of another Goliath. I, I, I believe in nonviolence, so, so let, let, let me hasten to add, it may not uh, necessarily be a, a militaristic uh, kind of taking off the head of Goliath, but you have to face down the giant in our society one way or another. Critical race theory comes to our aid in this point because alongside the scripture, uh, critical race theory argues that racism is a built-in, baked-in feature of American life. Uh, I hope y'all are with me in the comments. Critical race theory argues that racism uh, is not, uh, as one source would have it, a passing feature of uh, American life, but critical race theory is instead uh, a permanent feature of American life. Uh, and I want to bring into the conversation the late uh, Derek Bell to help us visualize this thing. Derek Bell was uh, an attorney, an activist, and a professor widely regarded as uh, a godfather of critical race theory. And Derek Bell's idea of something called racial uh, realism helps us to get at the truth that we're dealing with this uh, evening. Bell's theory of racial uh, realism, uh, and I need you to type that in the comments so that we're walking together, racial realism. Racial realism is the idea that uh, racism may change institutional arrangements, uh, but white supremacy remains even when it takes a different shape. 
Uh, and his point is that the law may blunt certain effects of racism, uh, but just like a river sometimes finds its way to flow into a different channel, uh, past the dam, past the barricades, racism is a kind of river uh, that erodes legal protections against discrimination, erodes legal protections against racial harm and exploitation. Uh, and, and, and it's important to note this because many of us may have seen uh, in our push alerts uh, the information about the 2020 census. Uh, and the 2020 census reveals that uh, in uh, a, a few decades, we're going to uh, no longer, in terms of population, uh, be a country that is predominantly uh, composed of white folk. Uh, but we're going to be in a place numerically uh, where black folk and Latinx folk will ultimately be uh, the majority and will no longer, uh, on a demographic basis, uh, be in a country where uh, white folks are the majority. So some see that and suggest that demographics is destiny. Uh, and they suggest that because uh, those who are in the majority position is changing, uh, maybe that means we're in a post-racial moment. Maybe that means we're in a moment where uh, children won't be judged by the color of their skin, but they'll be judged instead by the content of their character. Uh, because the population uh, numbers are changing, maybe it means that all this talk about racism uh, is just people complaining and moaning and not uh, doing the hard work of, uh, uh, of exercising sufficient effort and displaying adequate merit in the workplace. Maybe, some say, uh, because the census numbers are changing, we need to stop having all of these uncomfortable conversations about slavery. Maybe because the demographics are changing, we need to stop talking about intersectionality and we need to stop talking about entrance convergence, which means the only time we get significant justice is when uh, it's in the interest of the dominant culture to pass legislation, to see a court decision go by. Maybe uh, some suggest in light of the census numbers changing, we ought to just put to bed this idea that racism is a significant problem. And I want to suggest uh, that critical race theory performs the, uh, the, the great service of throwing a cold splash of water in the midst of that falsehood. Critical race theory is the cold splash of water in the midst of the national pastime of myth-making that America is an innocent nation. Critical race theory is the cold splash of water that wakes us up from the misty-eyed illusion uh, that America has been committed to liberty and justice for all from its inception. Critical race theory is what we need to make sure that we have a kind of civic truth uh, which has the potential to set us free. Critical race theory, uh, in other words, helps us to, to see that we haven't come as far in some ways as we think we have. Uh, and let me see if I can walk this out in a different way. Yes, it's true uh, that we have uh, a larger black uh, professional class than we did in the 1960s. It's true that uh, we have more doctors, more lawyers, more uh, architects, more accountants. And even though we have an expanded black middle class, uh, that does not erase or deny the structural exploitation that exists at the margins. What are you talking about, Pastor Andrew? Did you know, family, that the minimum wage at $7.25, the federal minimum wage, which is $7.25, pays for less than it did in 1968. And if the minimum wage buys less now than it did when we were singing, we shall overcome, it means that the celebration of racial progress is premature and hollow if we don't look at the facts, the data, and the details. It's an easy thing. It's, it's, uh, Malcolm X used to say it this way, we, we sweet talk each other into believing that we've gone a further distance than we actually have. But when you run the numbers, when you run the receipts, America is just as racist now as it was when the Articles of Confederation were signed. If you run the receipts and look at the numbers, America is still practicing racism in our political culture that gets codified into regulatory codes and codified into legal statutes. And we don't say this with uh, any sort of glee or glass 
gladness, we say it because the only way that we can truly experience freedom is to be honest about the level of encaging that's happening in society, to be honest about the level of a predictable exploitation in society, by which I mean this family, that race is still a predictor of one's life outcomes and the quality and standard of living that one enjoys in some respects more than any other factor. So if we're going to experience the freedom that Christ wants us to have, if we're going to overcome, as Jesus puts it in John 16, we've got to be plain spoken and clear about what it is we're facing. Critical race theory points out, family, uh, that all of the victories that we celebrate have an asterisk by them. The Voting Rights Act and uh, the, the Civil Rights Act and the Fair Housing Act of 1968, wonderful accomplishments, but there's an asterisk. Uh, the, uh, the progressive era of the late 19th century, wonderful accomplishments, uh, helped to give us uh, more fair wages for decent employment, but there's an asterisk there. Uh, the New Deal era was, was, was a wonderful time of uh, repairing parks and making sure that we had more of our social insurance system in place, but there's an asterisk because black folk uh, were excluded from legal protections in domestic labor and the work that was happening agriculturally in terms of sharecropping. It's a wonderful, uh, uh, promising set of policy, but there's an asterisk there. And critical race theory uh, raises its hand in the American celebration of progress and trial triumph and manifest destiny and says we haven't come as far as we think we have. Is racism permanent? Well, kind of. When you look at the details on this side of heaven, family, uh, I know it's a, a, a tough word to consider, uh, but racism uh, is kind of permanent when you take uh, a socio-historical perspective. I promise we're going to bring it all together after a while, uh, but I want to make sure that we're, we're looking squarely at the situation that we face, uh, not only domestically in America, but looking at uh, globally. Uh, how racial capitalism and the color line of imperialism uh, has saddled uh, nations from, uh, from Haiti uh, all the way to uh, nations in the global south and Latin America and uh, sub-Saharan Africa with debts that they did not create, but debts with their, which they are obliged to pay, not because of justice, not because of fiscal responsibility, but because the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank will not roll back the uh, uh, the, the, the intercontinental effects of white supremacy and racism. We got to be plain spoken about the fact that, that we did not create the problems that we're dealing with. Racism created the environmental conditions that make it harder for black folk to experience joy. And when we don't acknowledge that, we end up blaming the victim. We end up talking about black on black crime and we end up talking about black wealth as if this is not a country that was founded on stolen land and stolen labor. And if America's uh, uh, pole position at the top of the global economy is not uh, backed and built by bloodstains, we've got to be clear about where we are in order to figure out how we're going to get going to a place of overcoming. Uh, and as sobering as what critical race theorists uh, have to say, I want to suggest that uh, it's not an unprecedented matter. As blunt as... Um, Lord, uh, help me say it, as uh, to the point, uh, as much as critical race theorists uh, give us the vinegar and withhold the honey, uh, we have a savior and a sage. We have a prophet and a high priest who told us in John's 16th chapter that in this world, you will have trouble. Jesus didn't sugarcoat and say, in this world, you might have trouble. Jesus didn't sugarcoat and say, after you uh, become my disciple, you will no longer have trouble. Jesus didn't tell us that if you pray passionately and if you speak in tongues and if you can memorize all the scripture, you'll no longer have trouble. Jesus did not tell us that if you get a college degree, you'll no longer have trouble. Jesus did not tell us that if you join this fraternity and join this sorority, that you'll no longer have trouble. Jesus didn't tell us that 
that if you rent or if you own, you'll no longer have trouble. I'm going to make it plain. Jesus didn't tell us that if you have a 401k that you'll no longer have trouble. Jesus didn't tell us that if you have stocks and bonds and mutual funds that you'll exempt your way out of trouble. Jesus did not tell us that we can get a, uh, uh, that we can obtain a get out of structural injustice and crystallized evil past. Jesus tells us that in this world, you will have trouble. Jesus uh, helps us to find a kind of biblical synonym uh, for structural racism. Trouble, uh, in other words, family, is nothing other than a, a synonym for sin, family. Uh, trouble uh, describes the suffering that black folk experience due not to uh, our own uh, efforts, but due to American apartheid. In this world, Jesus tells us, you will have trouble. Uh, but I'm grateful that our Lord and Savior uh, doesn't leave us on the edge of trouble without giving us a further word. I'm grateful that Jesus doesn't leave us on uh, the, the, the somber, sour, and dispiriting note of trouble with a promise of nothing else. I'm grateful that Jesus doesn't just talk. Uh, I might as well be blunt. I'm grateful that Jesus is not in the Afro-pessimist tradition where all we see is trouble and flood and fire and flames and have no way of envisioning something better than what we're in right now. I'm grateful that Jesus does not end in verse 33 by saying, in this world, you will have trouble. Because the last time I looked in my Bible, Jesus says, in this world, you will have trouble. But take heart, says Jesus, for I have overcome the world. Jesus says, you not only have trouble, but he uh, commands us to take heart, for I have overcome the world. And the question is, how are we to take heart uh, in the midst of racism? If racism keeps on uh, updating itself like new iPhones and new Nintendos, how are we to take heart? Uh, if, if, if racism uh, keeps coming out with uh, brand new additions, like we got brand new Teslas, how are we supposed to, to take heart? If racism keeps repositioning and reconfiguring itself into a different algorithm and a different advertisement, how are we to take heart? Uh, I want to suggest that uh, we take heart by participating in the life of Christ. When we participate in the life of Christ who overcomes, it helps us to experience in our hearts the measure of victory that we need to fight, the victory that we need to struggle, the victory that we need to wage uh, spiritual warfare against powers and principalities and wickedness, not only in high places, but wickedness in Washington, D.C., and wickedness in state houses, and wickedness uh, with respect to multilateral institutions that are supposed to have the common good of every nation, but more often than not tend to only have the common good of European nations and America and everybody else that's aligned with NATO. If we are to take heart, we have to participate in the life of Jesus, praying as he taught us, prayers that bring together love and justice, fasting as he taught us, recognizing that in the Hebrew prophetic tradition, fasting is not only about pushing your plate away, but fasting that the Lord desires loosens the yoke and the bond of injustice. If we are going to uh, participate in the life of Christ and take heart in the midst of a racist society, take heart with our eyes open and not have a religion that is a pacifier and acceptance of the uh, uh, structurally unfair conditions that we have, if we're going to take a uh, heart and think clearly, we have to participate in the life of Jesus Christ. Flipping over tables as he taught us, praying as he taught us, fasting as he taught us, denouncing uh, widows' houses being sold on the market like he taught us. Nothing but a first century version of foreclosure. If we're going to take heart, we have to participate in the life of the real Christ, not the, the, the white evangelical Christ, not the uh, imperial Christ, but we have to participate fully in the life of Jesus Christ. There's two specific ways I want to share with you, and then uh, I'll take my seat. How is it that we participate in the life of Christ? The first way that we participate in the life of Christ is by celebrating each win against racism as a preview of Christ's final dethroning of white supremacy. The, the first way that we uh, take heart and uh, 
join in Christ's overcoming of the world is to celebrate each win against racism as participating in Christ's final overcoming of the world. Uh, what I'm suggesting, family, is that every blow against racism foreshadows the death blow that Jesus will land against racial capitalism and the color line of imperialism that we experience. Family, no victory uh, is too small to celebrate. No win is too minor. No triumph is, is too piecemeal. What I'm suggesting is that uh, every time uh, we see a Karen triad and their racist plots uh, don't succeed, we ought to give the Lord some praise. Uh, every time we see a cop who applies disproportionate force uh, against uh, uh, our brothers and, and sisters and siblings in Christ, uh, be they white or black, every time someone participates in the machinations of white supremacy and that plan is thwarted, we ought to celebrate that no weapon formed against us shall ultimately prosper. Every time we win against uh, a racial microaggression at work, every time we find ourselves uh, beating back racist schooling by establishing a library personally of black thinkers and black scholars, every time we overcome uh, the history of redlining by buying an affordable home as a black family or renting somewhere and having a stable relationship with our land Lord, every time we have a victory against racism, we ought to celebrate. It doesn't mean that we've made it to the mountaintop. It may not mean that uh, we can lay down our gloves, but we ought to and we deserve celebration as the people of God. Celebrating every blow against racism uh, is an area uh, where we can uh, take heart by focusing on the reasons we have to give joy. I want you to know that every time uh, we see uh, a meaningful reform against racism, we ought to give the Lord some praise. It may not be everything we want, uh, but every time we can see uh, no-knock warrants in in uh, Kentucky, we ought to give God praise. Every time we see uh, families being able to make uh, enough money to take care of their families and not have to be filled uh, with preventable anxiety that's caused by outside forces, we ought to give God some praise. Every time we see the winds of God's justice push against racism, that's a cause for giving God praise. Uh, and I want us to have a celebratory spirit, family, uh, because even though the foe we fight changes faces and changes forms, uh, we ought to celebrate uh, each uh, battle uh, like we know that Christ has already won the victory. Uh, every time we fight against racism and we win, family, uh, we have an interlude of, of success. We ought to have a disposition of taking heart. Second thing I want to suggest is that uh, not only do we need to have a spirit of celebration, uh, but that we experience and participate in Christ's overcoming by practicing incarnational encouragement. Incarnational encouragement. Uh, what I mean by that is when we focus uh, our attention on Christ, uh, it helps us to take heart because the text uh, doesn't say that we have overcome the world. Uh, the text says that Christ has overcome the world. The, the, the text does not say that, that we have uh, directly overcome the world, but Jesus tells us to take heart uh, because Christ has overcome the world. This is why uh, songs say, because he lives, I can face tomorrow. And because Jesus took uh, the worst of Rome's uh, imperial cross and died, uh, we, we got to be clear about die and get rose from the grave by the power of the Holy Spirit because Jesus lives. That is our reference point of incarnational encouragement because Jesus lives. Uh, it gives us the, um, the, the, the confidence and uh, the basis to trust uh, that if God did it for Jesus after a while, uh, God will do it for us like God did it for the firstborn of all creation. Uh, and I, I, I land here, and I'm coming to, to a close uh, in just a few moments, family. It's important to find uh, incarnational encouragement uh, because any old regular encouragement won't do when we're talking about white supremacy. Regular schmegular encouragement won't inspire us to stand up against the shape-shifting forces of racism. We need an example of God suffering what we suffer yet winning anyhow. We need to know that God dealt with a condition of being 
unhoused, that God dealt with the condition, according to some biblical scholars, of Jesus may not necessarily being able uh, to read terribly well. We need to know that Jesus uh, experienced uh, oppression, uh, not only from Rome, but uh, the suspicion of his own people being a prophet not respected in his hometown. And despite assuming our condition and enduring our condition, Jesus experiences victory. When we focus on how Christ overcomes, it gives us the legitimate basis to believe that we too shall overcome. The case study of Jesus' story is our basis for believing that empires do fall that Satan ultimately loses and that white supremacy isn't supreme. The Jesus story uh, establishes our eventual, uh, it establishes our confidence uh, that God's justice will triumph over racism. Uh, And what I'm simply saying to you, family, is that if Jesus uh, could overcome Judas, uh, selling out the Jesus movement for 30 pieces of silver, uh, we can face uh, the, uh, the, the Lord have mercy. Help me to say this in a judicious way. Uh, We can deal with black folks selling out our people for votes and speaking gigs and monthly retainers. If Jesus uh, could overcome counterfeit worship, uh, then we can tackle white denominations' uh, general refusal to deal with the implications of systemic racism, which require repentance, which require reparations, which require a reckoning with the truths that we don't fully tell, certainly not in our public schools, and uh, not really in many of our houses of worship and in our sanctuaries. If Jesus overcame first century social evils, uh, then we too can address our 21st century crucifixions. Incarnational encouragement in Jesus' story gives us what we need to face uh, 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 the racism that we face in our stories and to try to cast out those demons. Jesus tells us, family, that in this world, Uh, you will have trouble. Uh, But take heart, for I have overcome the world. Uh, And what Jesus helps us uh, to appreciate family uh, is nothing other than the tradition that our ancestors gave us. They told us that trouble uh, don't last always. The ancestors told us that uh, there will come a day when the wicked uh, will cease from troubling. We are informed and inspired by those who taught us that trouble Uh, Double love doesn't have the last word. Uh, And I'm reminded of a song that tells us that uh, at the end of the day, uh, we don't have to be afraid of the water because uh, there's a song that used to say that God is going to trouble the water. Uh, God troubling the water lets us know that even though in this world we'll have racist trouble, we can trust that God comes in Jesus to trouble the waters. Even though in this world we have trouble born of white supremacy, we can take heart because we know that in Jesus we have a template for troubling the waters. We can uh, have encouragement that is not false optimism because Jesus is our antecedent of God facing the very worst that this world had to deliver and still coming out on top after a while. We can encounter every trouble that we face in our lives personally, institutionally, and societally, trusting uh, that the trouble we face can be overcome ultimately because the Jesus who faced trouble and won is our blueprint for knowing that we can ultimately overcome trouble. Uh, And so to to, to wrap this up, family, uh, and I know this is a a different sort of sermon. If if, if you're tuning in uh, towards the front end, I I don't want to hide the ball. I want to give it to you straight. Is racism permanent? The facts seem to suggest that in our socio-historical moment, uh, we will always be fighting a form and a version of racism. This is what racial realism argues. Uh, But through the eyes of faith, uh, we can trust that the God who comes in Jesus to trouble the waters gives us uh, the resolution, gives us the determination to fight against racism and to celebrate every victory, knowing uh, that God is eventually going to strike the final death blow against racism. And this perhaps may be why in the same gospel book, Jesus not only says in this world you will have trouble in John 16, But Jesus also says in John 14, let not your hearts be troubled. 
J Jesus has this dialectic. Jesus has this paradox of you'll have trouble, uh, but let not your hearts be troubled because of the presence of Christ and the power of Christ. And uh, I want to argue the ultimate uh, prevailing position that Christ has uh, by being Lord over the world, uh, even Lord over a creation that is beset with white supremacy. Uh, so we'll win in the end, family. Uh, but this side of heaven, uh, let us fight. Let us fight. Let us fight. God bless you. Hallelujah. We thank God for the sermon that uh, Pastor Andrew has just delivered to us. He delivered a hard but clear word. But y'all, we have a Savior who, who knew all this stuff was going to go down. Who, who still is mindful enough of us to make sure that we are cared for, that we have everything we need. Is that anybody else's testimony that regardless of the systematic structures and, and barriers that have been put up that we've been preaching about all month, you still have what you need. You still have a place to lay your head. You still have food in your belly. You still have a job to call your own. God is faithful. I will remain confident confident. Though racism may seem permanent, I will remain confident. Though situations may abound that don't favor me, I will remain confident that I will live to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. My God today. So y'all, as we go to end this service, we can't end this series or this service without giving you an opportunity to get to know this God in whom we trust. This God in whom uh, uh, the Bible says that, that, that he, he looks down favorably upon us. This, this God who cares about even those whose backs are against the wall, even those sun-kissed saints who, who feel like sometimes nobody's got our back. The Lord has our back and is determined to make sure that you will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. It is because of this that I did not give up. It is because of God's grace and mercy that we are not consumed. You want to know this guy that we talking about? Right on the bottom of the screen is a number where you can text us. If you want to get saved, if you want to join this church, if you just need some prayer, if you got questions, if this series unlocks some questions for you, this is your point of decision. The Bible says when you hear the voice of the Lord, harden not your heart. God has a whole lot of things God wants to do with you. Trust me, we did this series not to make you depressed or sad, to make sure you were informed so that every time God does something good for you, you know where all your blessings are to go. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise God, all creatures here below. So listen, we're going to give you a couple more minutes. The praise team is going to just sing another verse of that song. If you don't need God the way your neighbor needs God, then I need you to intercede right now. This is important spiritual business. Don't end the stream. Somebody needs you praying for them. Somebody needs you interceding for them. While the praise team sings, text this number. Respond in the comments. Send us a direct message. However you need to get to us, get to us so that the Lord can continue to do the Lord's work. Amen, somebody. Come on, praise him. I'm going to see you. Say that with me. I will remain. I will remain comforted. comforted in this right I here. Will see will the goodness of the Lord. Cause He's a good Father. Yeah. I will remain, remain comforted in this here. I will see I'm gonna see the goodness of the Lord. The Lord. According to our faith, we will see. Hey, my faith fail me not. Lord, I believe you're going to. I believe. I believe you're going to provide. I believe you're going to heal. I believe you will deliver. Yeah. I will see the goodness 
of the Lord. Let us pray, y'all. Oh, God, we are confident in your word. We're confident in what the scriptures have taught us, that we don't have to die to see your goodness, but we will see your goodness in the land of the living. And for that, we give you praise. Lord, somebody's been journeying with us all month long, and they've been dealing with this critical race theory. They've been dealing with their own faith, and they're ready to go deeper. They're ready to trust you more. They're informed, and they're ready for the battle. God, I pray that you would equip them with every tool they need when somebody tries to rise up against them on their job, when somebody tries to rise up against them in their household, when somebody tries to fight against them with the armor you've given. God, I pray that you would give them the full armor of God so that they have everything that they need, the breastplate of righteousness and the helmet of salvation and all the other things that you've given us, Lord, as they go into battle day after day. Protect them, God. Allow them to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. God, I pray that every person who's journeyed with us through this series might go into the communities they occupy and remove the scales from people's eyes. Help them to see what God would have for us. Help them to see what true followers of Jesus Christ should be implementing in the world. God, I pray that you will equip us with the power of your Holy Spirit to do the hard work in the closed doors rooms. And remember that we don't have to die to see your goodness, but we will see, we shall see, we will see, we shall see. Ha. We will see. We shall see. Come on, somebody. We will see. We'll we see. shall see. We shall see. We will see. We will see. We shall see. We shall see. We will see. We shall see. Come on. We will see. We shall see the goodness of the Lord yes, Lord. Yes, in Lord. the land of the living. You can't die yet. Because you haven't seen the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. You can't quit yet. Because you haven't seen the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. You shall live and not die. You shall live and not die. You will be the head and not the tail. The lender, not the borrower. Come on, somebody. We will see. We will see. We shall see. I'm black. I'm beautiful. And I will see. Huh? Uh, uh, the system set up against me, but I will see. We, we will see. We shall see. The goodness. I would have fainted. Hallelujah. Had I believed that we'll see the goodness. I would have died, but I believe that we will see the goodness of the Lord. The goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Black faith says, we shall see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Yes, Command your soul to yes, bless the Lord. Command your soul yes, to bless the Lord. I will bless the Lord yes, at all times. Yes, God's yes, praises yes. shall continually, continually be in my mouth. My soul will make her boast in the Lord. The enemies were here there. I sought the Lord. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And he answered me, CJ. I sought the Lord. Yes. And he answered me. He delivered me from all. Oh, come on. We can't end this in defeat. Thank you, Lord. We're not going to end this in defeat. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, Chase. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, Chase. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, Chase. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your goodness. Hallelujah. We could never repay you for your goodness. I need a we prayer break. We could never repay you for your goodness. Thank you for your goodness. Yeah, yeah. I thank 
you for your goodness. I thank you for your goodness. I thank you for your goodness. I thank you for your goodness. I thank you for your goodness. I thank you for your goodness. I thank you for your goodness. I thank you for your goodness. Say I thank you. see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Go back and watch every week of this series. And even after you process all of that, you will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. God bless you. We'll see you virtually next week and in person on September 12th. You will see. I thank you for your goodness. I thank you for your goodness. Say, I thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your goodness. Yeah. I thank you for your goodness. Yeah. Oh yeah. Thank yeah. You for your yeah. Thank you. Thank you for your goodness. I thank you for your goodness.